we just try to, you know, give give the right uh, information, time, energy into, you know, introducing ideas, explaining the why, and then if if we're moving forward, we're sure as hell going to take the ball and run with it and get it across the goal line. Welcome to Multifamily Insights. I'm your host, John Kasman, and I want to thank you for joining us for another great episode. If you're enjoying, enjoying this show and getting some great value, we would love your feedback. Leave us a rating and review and some honest feedback to tell us more about the show so we can make it work harder for your investing goals. And if you haven't done so, make sure you hit that follow or subscribe button, especially if you get good value out of today's guest. Today, we will be talking to Frank B. Hanna, Jr., they say you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So if you want to grow as a multifamily investor, you have to spend more time with other multifamily investors. And an easy way to do that is to join our apartment investing mastermind group today. Just go to kasmancapital.com and click on the mastermind button. Now, as a part of this group, you'll get access to expert trainings, group coaching calls, industry news and updates, as well as all of our webinars and workshops, including our three-hour workshop on raising capital. Again, if you want to be around other multifamily investors that can help you scale your portfolio today and grow your network, make sure you're a part of the Apartment Investing Mastermind. Just go to kasmancapital.com and click on the Mastermind button today. Frank B. Hanna Jr. is a private wealth advisor with a passion for helping individuals build wealth. Now, after running successful family establishments in the restaurant and hospitality industries, he made a bold transition into finance driven by a desire for, fulfill for fulfillment and a recognized gap in the industry. Now, with his unique perspective as an entrepreneur, Frank brings captivating storytelling and ex expertise in real estate development, tax management, and private investment. Let's welcome to the show. Frank B. Hanna Jr. Thanks, John. Glad to be here. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Frank, it's great to have you on the show. I went over your bio at a very, very high level. Why don't you take two minutes and fill in some of those gaps? Yes. Yeah, so um, I uh, was brought up in the restaurant hospitality industry and I kind of was told all my life that's what I was going to be doing and uh, ultimately got about 10, 15 years into that and realized I don't want to do this and I wasn't happy and had a little experience in real estate and some estate tax asset protection type stuff and partnered with a guy and we started a kind of hybrid holistic financial planning company with um, you know some great resources to be able to apply into real estate and other um, you know other areas of interest. So I think we have kind of a unique process driven approach to the things that we put together and um, it's been great. I've been at it for about 15 years and um, best move ever made. I love it. Well, let's talk about that transition a little bit, right? So you were in the hotel, mm -hmm. or I'm sorry, in the restaurant industry doing hospitality as well, 10 to 15 years, realized that wasn't the path you wanted to go down. What mm -hmm. was it that made you realize that wasn't a fit for you? I just hated life, to be honest with you. I, I, there was, I was working 100 Hundred and hundred to one hundred and ten hours a week. Had no personal life. My my marriage was suffering. Never saw my kids. I was fighting with my family, and I really just wasn't getting any self fulfillment. And I was sitting on the sidelines watching my life pass me by at hundred miles an hour. And um, ultimately, it took me probably five years to have the courage to kind of walk away. And I'd floated the idea to my father and family, and they just were not, you know, in the mood to hear anything of the sort. So I left with next to nothing and kind of had a falling out with the family started from scratch. And, um, you know, when you're in a, uh, sales type business with two young kids with no income and little to no savings, it's, uh, it's amazing, uh, what you can accomplish. But I, I used to joke that on a, a Friday, I'd feel pretty good going, going home, feeling like I had done a lot of good things during the week. And by Monday morning, I was scared to death that I didn't have enough going on. Um, so slowly just built this sales business and really just kind of, um, you know, was mentored by a lot of great people, made a lot of great connections and tried to just build something that we felt was unique to the marketplace and really just try to bring an entrepreneurial feel to a you know, a business that I'd say was more sales oriented. And, um, you know, I think it gives us a unique perspective to kind of sit on the other side of the desk 
when you're explaining to a successful, fast moving entrepreneur, hey, this is why you should consider this. Here's the how and here's the why versus, hey, just do this and assume, you know, I know what I'm talking about. You should just do it. So I think people understand that. Um, and half the battle is just slowing people down enough to look at opportunities, evaluate them, give them information and let them make an educated decision on what's best for them. So we joke and we say we're good at tackling. So, you know, anybody that's successful is moving quick and uh, we're politely persistent. That's what I like to call it. And getting these entrepreneurs to uh, slow down long enough to look at opportunities and explain them in a simple yet sophisticated way and um you know motivate them to to act i really like that term politely persistent i wrote that down that's that's good uh um, you talked like about <clears throat> yeah <laughs> you talked about that transition right really kind of a, a fracture with the family business going out on your own no very little savings and really having to have that drive and that hunger to get something going and take care of your family um talk to us more about what you ultimately created. I mean, I know it's a finance kind of business, but talk to us more. I mean, obviously it's a pretty broad spectrum. Yeah. So I, I started with a firm that um, was really focused. They were focused more on like high level estate planning. So it was a state tax trust dealt a lot with like high net worth entrepreneurs who were staring at, you know, estate issues or inheritance taxes. And they were really good at marketing. So they, they taught you how to kind of what they call whale hunt and go find these big, um, super effluent entrepreneurs. But their ultimate angle was selling them insurance or annuities and that type of stuff. And, and there's a market for it. We still do some of that stuff, but it's got to be the right fit for the right person. So the takeaways I got from that firm were they really taught me how to market. And, uh, you know, some would call it stalking, but it's, I would call it a nice way to evaluate. Like I could quickly go to you, John, and do a little research on you and probably find a network of key people that are around you that are like-minded individuals that I could reach out and, and help in some capacity. <clears throat> so we've got some pretty good systems to be able to evaluate the marketplace and, um, you know, find those individuals that are hiding in plain sight. So they taught us a lot about marketing, a lot about estate, trust, asset protection, you know, some pretty sophisticated stuff. But at the end of the day, I felt like we were pigeonholed in, into that. And we made a, a number of moves to just become more independent in nature where we didn't have an ax to grind with any solution or product that was available to us. And, um, you know, that kind of evolved to more, um, independent asset management. We manage about a billion and a half dollars in a variety of different vehicles for everything from equities, fixed income, commodities, real estate, obviously. Um, and we've kind of capitalized on, you know, different planning needs and different tax plays to really just give proactive solutions to, to the, you know, to that entrepreneur that, you know, typically has a team in place. We always say, you know, there's a lot of good accountants, attorneys, advisors that are out there. Um, not not always the case, but I see a lot of them that are more reactive than proactive. If you call them and say, hey, I need you to do X, Y, and Z for me, they'll do it for you. Um, but they lack, you know, you know, I, I'd say a quarterback for lack of a better term. So oftentimes we'll come in and we're idea guys. We come in and say, hey, here's an idea. If you like it, let's Let's make sure your team of advisors um, understands it. They're on the same page. We don't want to waste our time or your time with with an idea that's not going to make sense or that everybody's not on the not embracing. Um, so yeah, we 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 kind of evolved into a independent shop that's got kind of like a hybrid, sophisticated real estate syndication arm that uses sophisticated tax plays. Um, for entrepreneurs. And then we have a lot of great resources for, you know, traditional planning needs, estate, tax, trust, uh, business succession planning, buying, selling business, all types of stuff. If, if, um, if we're not the right fit for somebody that comes to us with a need, I know exactly who to point them to. Um, so I always say we're a great resource 
hub um, to get people to where they need to be if they've got a need. Frank, I love what you said. You talked about really coming into that transition, being at a firm that focused on estate tax, trust planning, asset protection, having really great marketing systems, but some limitations of what you could and couldn't do. Ultimately, you kind of brought, broke off and did your own shop independently, helping individuals in a variety of ways, right? Talking about uh, not just those things that I just mentioned, but also looking into real estate syndications and, you know, 1031 exchanges and other strategies that can allow these individuals to maximize uh, their wealth, but also the overall asset protection and, and um, you know, really the estate planning that comes with that. A couple of things you said that really jumped out to me. One is typically you're dealing with entrepreneurs that may have advisors and a team around them, but, you know, you're kind of taking the moment to be persistent and to quote unquote tackle these individuals to get them to stop long enough to actually think through. And then you all are really helping them understand that, Hey, we can quarterback the idea, but you still need to have folks who can execute and implement these strategies. I think for a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of our listeners, you know, one of the hangups they have when they think about their financial position is they may have these people on the team, but they are reactive, as you mentioned, right? If I call my guy and say, hey, you know, haven't looked at my son's, you know, estate plan or haven't looked at, you know, my trust in some years, can we do that? Then sure, they'll, they'll, they'll do that, right? When I'm talking to my CPA or, you know, I'm going and trying to figure out my taxes, of course, they'll do that. But very few of them are proactively reaching out to say, hey, it's the end of Q1. Where do you expect to be at the end of the year? How are you, how are you tracking? What adjustments should you make? Like, let's think through a game plan so that you're making these things in advance of tax season as opposed to just reactively doing my taxes. Can you talk about, you know, really the need for more forward-looking strategy to help these entrepreneurs, but really any professional, maximize their, their capital and really drive wealth? Yeah, I would say, um, yeah, great uh, summary there, John. Uh, you know, there's there's some fantastic, um, you know, counsel, planners, accountants, attorneys, whatever you want to call them. I think, yeah, I think the marketplace has evolved, and you can probably relate this to any industry. But they're they're overworked. There's not as there's not enough people coming into that industry. So most of the CPA firms I work with they don't have the manpower, you know, there's not enough hours in the day to, to do all the things that they need to do for their clients. So they're doing everything they can to crank out their tax returns and, and be as proactive as they can be. But oftentimes, you know, unless we're bringing an idea to the table, you know, it, it comes to March 15th, April 15th and, and the accountants doing just enough to get the return across the finish line for the client. Um, so that's where we've got to have that dialogue you know, systematically through the year to give those ideas and those planning solutions uh, to the client that we can run by the accountant. And ultimately, nine times out of 10, the accountant embraces it. And oftentimes the client says, well, how come you never mentioned it to me if uh, if that was available to me? So um, again, I think it's, I, I think everybody needs it. It's a, it's a team, you know, we're not perfect, um, but it's a team effort for everybody that that's out there and same thing with the client you know there's clients that i've had in the past that we need to hold them accountable too so we'll meet and say hey here's here's the ideas what makes sense to pursue here's the game plan what are you going to handle what am i going to handle and ultimately the client wouldn't deliver on what they said they were going to do and it compromises our ability to do our job so um again we just try to you know give give the right uh, information, time, energy into, you know, introducing ideas, explaining the why. And then if, if we're moving forward, we're sure as hell going to take the ball and run with it and get it across the goal line. Um, we talked a little bit about taxes. Um, what advice or, you know, a piece of advice would you have for someone about maybe minimizing their tax liability? So there's a lot of there's a lot of easy things that you can do on the tax side of things. I mean, if you're if you're an entrepreneur, you own a business uh, in some capacity. If if you're, well, let me take a step back. If you're if you're a um, an employee, you know, there's different things that are available to you, and above and beyond that, you're kind of limited, right? So if you've got, you know, 
401k, 403b, matching, like, you know, that's the basics. That's free money that you got to be taking advantage of. Above and beyond that, where it gets more creative is if you own your own business, um, you know, these are just some of the things that I take advantage of. Um, you know, I put my wife and kids on payroll, you know, I'm, st I'm still waiting for them to justify the pay that I'm giving them, but I give them a minimal amount of pay to be able to offset that, let them pay taxes at a lower rate than I would, and ultimately use those dollars to fund a Roth IRA or fund private um, education. There's a lot of different things that you can utilize there. Um, you know, furthermore, I see entrepreneurs that, you know, their, their life revolves around their business and I see them not taking advantage of things that I think make a lot of sense for them to deduct right off, you know, different things. They, they, they get scared to death of, you know, an audit from the IRS. And we, we absolutely want to do everything above board, but I see people being painfully conservative and not taking advantage of basic stuff like that. Then kind of above and beyond for there, from there, we do a lot of retirement plan analysis, cash balance, pension plans. If you're an entrepreneur and we do an analysis of your business and, you know, we've got a cap, we've got to consider age, compensation, tenure, a lot of different factors there. But if there's, and I, I'd say if there's a business owner that has 30 or less employees, they could qualify for like a cash balance pension plan, which is kind of like a 401k plan on steroids. But we've got to, you know, follow um, census and IRS guidelines. But I have entrepreneurs that maybe were in a simple IRA or a 401k and they were still paying a ton in income taxes. And we introduced a plan where they could sock away hundreds of thousands of dollars and tax deduct it. And maybe, maybe 90 plus percent went to the owner, owner and his wife, key employees. You're able to skew it in a way that you got to follow these guidelines, but there's a way where that, you know, I've got probably 25 clients that were paying hundreds of thousands of dollars in income taxes and now have cash balance pension plans that are rich with millions of dollars that they save that they'll be able to utilize for their retirement. Above and beyond that, um, you know, we do a lot in, you know, private real estate deals using accelerated depreciation. So each year we follow those guidelines. And if you are an individual with substantial enough passive income, whether that be rent or stock dividends or what have you, or you qualify as a real estate professional, which I think the, the rule is 750 hours per year or 14-ish hours per week, you can qualify for these accelerated depreciation deals. Some people do it on their own. They buy an asset, they do a cost segregation study, and then they fast forward all that depreciation to create a big loss in year one. We package deals like that where I've got realtors, real estate attorneys, um, developers, construction guys and gals um, that come in and they can put dollars into this fund and ultimately save them, you know, close to dollar for dollar in income taxes that are due. So those are just some of the some of the basic ideas. And there's a lot of them out there, but those are some things that I think have been, um, you know, more appealing um, in the last few years um, than in the past. I love it, man. You gave some great, great ideas there. Uh, you talked about one of the things you can do is pay your family members, right? So you pay your yeah. kids, pay a spouse. You can have business write-offs. A lot of times people avoid this because they don't want to flag down for an audit, but there are definitely some business write-offs you can take and you should take. You also mm -hmm. talked about that cash balance uh, pension plan, which sounds like a great opportunity. And then again, investing in real estate syndications, deals where you can get some of that depreciation write off, uh, particularly if you are a real estate professional. So really great insights right there on ways to mitigate your tax liability. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about real estate, right? Because a lot of times we when we talk to wealth advisors, um, they tend to shy away from real estate and they focus more on funds. And a lot of times, it's because those wealth advisors work for firms that have their own funds, right? They have their own, you know, whether it be uh, Fidelity or whoever it is, they have a fund. So they want to keep those, you know, those dollars 
in the company within the fund, maybe they're paid based on how much they have under management. Talk to us more about kind of how you advise your clients to invest in real estate and what does that structure kind of look like from your standpoint? Yeah. So I would say, um, you know, great point, John, you know, they're the publicly traded um, funds that are out there, everybody's got access to, right. And there's some, you know, there's some advantages to those disadvantages to those. But one thing I come away with is like, you know, in the public market, you don't control your own destiny, right? <clears throat> so you might have a great fund or great asset. But when, you know, a third of the fund chooses to liquidate your share price, and your benefits go in the toilet with it. So we, again, are 100% independent and agnostic, which I think makes us unique in the marketplace. We've got some really great systems and due diligence and check checks and balances that really, I think, put us in a great position for probability of success. You know, I always say, hey, nothing in life is risk-free, but I feel really good about our hit ratio and success ratio, but ultimately um, we took, we take a look at different opportunities every day, every week that are out there in a variety of different asset classes. And we've probably spent millions of dollars over the years, kind of finding and developing the best in class relationships that are really good in their, in their kind of, you know, in their lane or their sweet spot, right? We've got groups that just do multifamily type deals We've got groups that just do self-storage, hospitality, um, student housing. And, um, you know, we do a lot of due diligence on, again, the, the story of the why. Why does this asset make sense? You know, what's the demographics to where this asset's located? You know, you know, are they conservative by nature and their assessments and projections? You know, there's a lot of a lot of different players that are out there that chase people with a you know, high dividend or a high, you know, high projection of internal rate of return. And it sounds so good. And if it sounds too good, it usually is, you know, too good to be true. Um, but we've, we've kind of vetted that marketplace and we've got about, you know, I'd say 20 to 25 different groups that we currently work with that we feel incredibly confident in. And we, we package these, these deals in a variety of different, you know, tax structures. Some are there to be, um, eligible for 1031 exchange. You know, you've got, I think, 10,000 people every single day in the U.S. that are turning 65. So the transition of wealth from this baby boomer generation, because there's so many of them, is the biggest transition of wealth that's out there. Um, and a lot of people are unaware that these type of prepackaged, professionally managed 1031 exchange solutions are out there. We use a concept called a Delaware statutory trust. Really has nothing to do with Delaware. Um, but it's out there for whatever reason, a lot of people are just unaware of them. Then we use, you know, the, the other structure for the accelerated depreciation, people that are just looking to shelter as much income taxes as possible. And then we have kind of your more private, you know, real estate deal that people are more familiar with that is strictly just a, a total return play with some nice favorable tax treatment. Um, you know, so we've got, kind of got those three arms within the real estate business. But, um, you know, again, there's, you know, we're, we're in kind of uncharted territory, I would say, with these cap rates, interest rates, um, lack of inventory. So there's, you know, it's I, I'd say it's more important now than ever to really get good, you know, sound advice on what you're planning to do and not chasing something just to avoid you know, taxes and, and paying too much for an asset. Um, so I would say those are, um, you know, kind of three avenues that we've found a lot of success. And, um, it, you know, I'd say it's incredibly rare for us not to have a conversation with a client and them get value out of, uh, you know, what we can kind of educate them on and then let them do what makes the most, most sense in, in, in terms of their next move. Well, Frank, I'll tell you what stands out to me is we talk to a lot of different professionals from different backgrounds, and uh, you have a nice, uh, a nice level of experience and knowledge across the financial services industry as a whole, right? We talked about 1031 exchanges, we've talked about DSTs, we've talked about, you know, real estate syndications, we've talked about asset protection, we talked about uh, trust and estate planning and taxes. 
And it's very rare to talk to someone who really understands all those different concepts. And, you know, again, most folks either focus on taxes or they focus on, you know, estate planning. Uh, folks obviously focus on real estate syndications or their, uh, you know, their SEC attorneys. But it's kind of rare to find people who really understand kind of the the, the breadth and depth of the ways to leverage these different strategies. So I, I think it really is helpful for folks to understand and have someone like that on the team who can help to spearhead maybe ideas that your CPA hasn't heard of or this attorney isn't aware of or your you know estate planner hasn't done before, right? You need someone who can help in introduce these concepts so that you can maximize your returns and ultimately drive long-term wealth for you and your family. Uh, for folks who want to learn more, your website again is revxwealth.com. That's R-E-V-X wealth.com. Uh, I want to go back to something else you said earlier, which I thought was really interesting. You talked about starting out when you made that transition, the firm you were with really had a lot of great marketing tactics in place to help you learn how to find clients. And the term you use was whale hunt. We have a lot of listeners who are syndicators or looking to raise capital and do different things. And will probably be curious of maybe a strategy or a tactic that they could use to quote unquote whale hunt or to find investors who have capital. Do you have anything that stands out that they may be able to learn from? Yeah, um, I don't know if it's, um, you know, rocket science, but, uh, you know, we, we do a lot of like digging and you know, in social media, like there's a lot of opportunity to to see different people that are out there, who they're socializing with, who they work with. You know, we'll, so we'll, we've got some different programs that, we're, that we use and, and sometimes it's as basic as, as Google, right? So if John Kasman is a affluent entrepreneur that's had a ton of success he's typically running in circles with the same type of people, right? So I just got a referral from a guy that's one of the largest landowners in Maryland. And I'm coaching a guy that I just hired. And we just did a blanket search of this guy's name, board of directors, this guy's name, donations, this guy. And there's all these public articles and it shows you transactions that they've done with. There's articles where he's shaking hands with different people. Sometimes you can even go to like Facebook or Instagram, find some of these people that are, that are, you know, maybe it may be older, but still technology, you know, technologically sound and maybe they participate that. So it's funny. I'll see a guy and say, oh, you know, I'm chasing this opportunity or maybe it's a client of mine. I see he's out to dinner with three or four people and I'll say, Hey, well, uh, I got, I got referred to uh, John Smith. That, Do you know him? And the guy goes, you wouldn't believe it. He's one of my best friends. I just had dinner with him the other night. And I'd say, get the hell out of here. Really? And do you mind if I call him and use your name? I've been referred to him 20 times, even though I've never, never been referred to him. So, uh, you know, sometimes it's uh, white lies or flubbing the truth or, or just doing the homework behind different things. So we do a lot of studying. If I'm going to call you, John, and pitch you on something I'm doing, I'm doing a ton of homework on who you are, where you came from, what your hobbies are, what public information I can get to you to make that call to you as warm as possible. Because I know you're a public figure and you probably get pitched by people all the time. And as soon as you hear that first sentence or two, you're like, oh man, not again. Um, but that's where that kind of preparation is, is key. And that homework that you do is I was telling the guy, <clears throat> if you're calling somebody that's important, you're probably going to get one at bat, right? You're going to get one at bat. And if you strike out, <laughs> that guy's never going to answer your call again. So you've either got to make a good enough first impression to get a meeting with that guy or his attention long enough to pitch him on what you're doing, what you're selling. Um, or, you know, do that in a way where you can, um, you know, get, get a second chance, get his cell phone. There's, there's a lot of different tools. I won't give up. I won't give all my tricks on here, but uh, if somebody wants to call and talk, we've got some pretty good systems. I love it, man. Great stuff. Then I think that's really helpful for people to wrap their head around that approach. And obviously you got to start somewhere, build those connections, but you definitely want to make sure you have a system and process in place. Again, if you want to learn more, you can go to revxwealth.com. Right now we're going to transition to our round of insights. All right, Frank, give me a failure or an apparent failure that sets you up for later success. Um, 
Yeah, I would just say, um, you know, little little failure is just, um, you know, not not acting in the here and now. You know, if you delay, you wait till later on a lot of things, whether it's small stuff or big stuff, it can make you pay. And I've I've had when I was younger make mistakes where you just put off different things or you're not as detailed on what you should be doing and ultimately you know as you get involved in your industry and the numbers get bigger in terms of the uh you know size of the deals and transactions you work on like there's a lot at risk there so um you know i would say that that's some small stuff i would just say act now write it down now make the move now don't wait because um, there's problems there that could arise. Um, you know, one of the things that was you know great for me is um, you know being being involved and here and now for your family, the people you care about. I've been in different you know points in my career where I was too consumed with work, and, and um, you know my personal life, my marriage suffered for a period of time, and um, ultimately. <clears throat> refocused and devoted that type of energy that I was um, traditionally um, contributed towards my work life to my my personal life and my kids and all that type of stuff because uh, that's that's what's most important so um, you know that those are some personal you know failures I would say it's not one big event but uh you know some things over time that I learned to uh, change and work harder in um, because it all matters. Give me a digital or mobile resource you recommend for your business. Um, um, let's see. Um, I would, um, I would say, um, is this is kind of old school and I haven't used this in a while, but like <clears throat> the reverse white pages, um, white pages database where you could take a client or a prospect and you can put in their phone number or address and it spits out all their their neighbors and affil affiliated people. Um, that was something kind of old school. I haven't done that in a while, but um, that was another way for me to market and look at like affluent neighbor neighborhoods, right? So if John Kasman lives in a two or three million dollar home guess what all his neighbors live in two or three million dollar homes um so that was another way where i can create a marketplace of people that i've been referred to and and go to john and say hey john i i got referred to somebody i think they live down your street john says yeah yeah they do we play golf together or we just smoked a cigar together and you know you just play uh, play dumb, but it's a way for you to create a market for yourself that might not otherwise be there because the old way of asking for referrals that everybody said is, you know, it's still effective, but you have clients that say, hey, sure, I'll help you. I'll flip through my phone. I'll go through my Rolodex and you have others that are reluctant and it puts them in an awkward place. So you got to be able to assess that when you're talking to your client or relationship. And if they're one of those more reluctant more uncomfortable type people with giving out a name that you're going to call and reference john and it might put them in an awkward spot you know going through the back door with some of those searches and the you know i've been referred to is another way for you to uh get access to some people you wouldn't otherwise and when you call into a market if i'm a straight cold call and nobody knows who the hell i am you know might i could probably got a less than one percent chance of getting getting in, you know, a 30 second or a minute or longer conversation with them. But when you lead in and I say, Hey, this is who I am. This is what I do. I do work with John Kasman and so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so. they immediately give you a little bit of credibility long enough to hear what you have to say. So I think again, that call, that all just comes into the preparation and planning. When we, when I first got in the business, our managers used to say, you guys need to do three, have 300 phone calls a day. 300 phone calls and some guys would just do it and it was so robotic and I would I kind of changed it and I said you know what I'm not doing 300 phone calls I'm going to do 50 really prepared phone calls where every phone call I got prepared to have I was on that guy's 
website. I was seeing what he was doing. I was seeing testimonials. I was seeing awards that they had. Like, so I came in, you know, blowing smoke or, you know, really warm and, and pumping up this guy's ego before I, you know, asked him to listen to me for a second. But again, I think that all comes in like the preparation of what you're doing. Give me the book you've recommended or gifted the most in the last year. I, I, I like, um, I've done a lot with the Grant Cardone books just because he's like a guy that, um, you know, he, he, he's a motivator, you know, he, he, I, I like his books because he gets me like pumped up. I love just like personal success stories. Like this is an old book, but like, uh, the shoe dog, the Phil Knight Nike story. Like I, I always like that. Cause it just, he got punched in the face a thousand times before he got that business launched. Um, I just started listening to uh, the Wolf of Wall Street, which might might not sound great in my my business, but for a guy that um, abused his trust and really had a um, a rough road after some initial success, <clears throat> there's some really good basic sales tech techniques that I think were applicable to the to the entrepreneur that um, has some integrity and can use them the right way. Um, so that's a book I thought was just interesting to hear, you know, kind of, you know, some, some good things that came of, uh, of that individual that ultimately <laughs> ran off the tracks and abused it. But um, he did have some really good sales techniques that were pretty interesting. What's a daily habit that helps you stay focused on your goals? Um, this was, I, I always do like daily affirmations, like, and this was something that first company taught us to do. And I thought it was kind of cheesy at the time, but like, you know, in the morning, um, we would write down our goals and, you know, get our stuff planned out in terms of, you know, prayer and, you know, what we were thankful for. And it really kind of let you, you know, have some perspective on, you know, how, how you were going to take your day and follow through on your goals. And then at the end of the day, it was really taking 15 minutes to take any positives whatsoever that you could get out of your day. And some days there's little to no positives, you know, but you had, I, there were days where I struggled and people screamed at me, hung up on me. I lost big cases and there was nothing to be happy about, but I would, you know, find one phone call, one conversation, one bit of business where I had a positive interaction with somebody and say, okay, there's the one or two good things. Um, and it really just kept, it keeps you grounded, keeps you focused, doesn't let you get too high, doesn't let you get too low. And I think that's, that's key on continuing to push forward because, um, you know, I used to compare it to like boxing and if you lead with your chin and you get too out in front of yourself and don't stay ground grounded, you're you're putting yourself in jeopardy of getting knocked out. Um, so those those were two things that again, when I started doing them, I thought they were like cheesy and a waste of time, but they do help you. That you need you need that because there's some really bad days that I can I have today, and I'm like, all right, I gotta think about my family and all the good things in my life, and it takes that thing that's staring you in the face that's terrible at the time and let you go you know what it's not that big a deal it'll it'll work itself out give me your number one insight for wealth planning got it um yeah well wealth planning i would just continue start to invest today whatever you're gonna do you know make a budget and carve off as little as you can you know whether it's ten dollars fifty dollars hundred dollars um and you start somewhere and that'll get you to your goals a lot faster, regardless of how you start. All right, last question here. You are outside of Philadelphia, known for its cheesesteaks, but give me your favorite place to grab a bite to eat. Um, I would say uh, I'm a big fan of, uh, let's see, um, Jim Steaks. So Pat and Gino's are probably the two most famous, but I think the Jim's is the best or another place. Angelo's is really good. Um, and, and Philly's got a ton of great steakhouses. Um, not sure which ones are my favorite, but, um, Steven Starr's a big, uh, 
restaurant tour. So he's got a bunch of good spots. Budokan, um, you yeah. know. Love it, man. Definitely some great options there for us to check out next time you're in Philly area. Frank, you gave some great stuff, man. You talked about really, you know, your background coming up in the restaurant industry. So having a great sense of what goes on there. But making that transition, you know, getting into the finance world, really being at an organization that was focused on marketing and sales, really cutting your teeth in that field, and then ultimately building out your own shop where you help folks with estate planning, taxes, uh, overall wealth strategies, real estate syndications and investments, and helping people understand how to really get the most out of their money. And I think that's really, really key. I uh, appreciate you talking to us about, you know, some different strategies to lower your tax liability, as well as ways to just maximize your overall wealth and performance. Again, for folks who want to learn more, they can go to your website, revxwealth.com. Again, that's revxwealth.com. And we'll put that link in our show notes. Thank you again for being a great guest and coming on Multifamily Insights. Frank, we look forward to staying in touch with you and hope you have a great day.